Good evening, everyone. I am Kinsey Kane with Global Campus Connections, and we are here in the WSU School of Hospitality Business Management with Executive Chef Jamie Callison and our two assistants. I am going to let them introduce our, themselves, excuse me, and then we'll get to do some cooking. My name is Caitlin Nystrom. I'm a sophomore from Spokane, Washington, and a hospitality business management major. Hello, uh, my name is Kate Stewart. I'm from uh, Union, Oregon, so I'm an out-of-stater, and I'm a junior in the hospitality business program. Perfect, so they're gonna be helping us this evening, and Chef Callison, who has been with WSU for eight years, in the business for 30 years, guys, is going to lead us through three dishes tonight. So without further ado, I know you're all excited, we're gonna get right to it. So ladies and gentlemen, take it away. Perfect. Well, welcome to my kitchen. Uh, I would like to talk a little bit about our, our cookbook, The Crimson Spoon. Uh, this book uh, was designed to kind of to showcase the best of WSU, and we're going to be using some of those products and recipes out of the cookbook tonight, um, which includes our uh, uh, crimson fire cheese, which it doesn't get any better than that. We're going we're gonna to start off by um, uh, making sure, one of the things I always believe is, is starting with good products, so making sure you choose uh, quality products before you start to cook with them, because you can't take... Um, uh, bad products and turn them into good. So what we're going to do with our jalapenos, uh, very important to to use gloves when you're dealing with hot peppers uh, because uh, the oils and the peppers can, uh, you, if you rub your eyes or anything, it can be very painful. So what we're going to start off with is we're going to trim our pepper. Cut it in half lengthways like this. And then we need to remove uh, most of these, uh, the white membrane and the seeds where the uh, spice is at. So we're going to cut into that. And remove. If you like your uh, jalapeno popper a little spicy, you can leave some of that in there. Uh, but make sure that um, you're really careful about the, the seeds. And again, the membrane is, is extremely spicy. The jalapeno itself eats almost like a uh, just like a green pepper, with hardly any spice. So what we're going to start now is we're going to start making our mix. We have our crimson fire cheese here and our cream cheese, Mr. Here, and Caitlin's going to mix these up for me. We're going to take our peppers. One of the things I like to do when I when I have company come over, or for events too, is you can also use the sweet peppers. The sweet peppers don't have any spice to them, and also it doesn't um, scare the guests away from enjoying um, the dish. So we have some peppers hollowed out here. And this is, this is a very, very simple um, dish. We, I would prefer using a mixer. Uh, a KitchenAid mixer works extremely well with a paddle attachment. However, I know that there's a lot of students watching tonight and also people at home may not have one of those, so we wanted to show a simpler technique. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this layer, a little bit of the cheese mixture in there. You don't want to put too much in there because when you bake it, it'll overfill on you. Have you finished that, Caitlin? So what we're going to do now is the best part of this dish is we're going to lay down the bacon. Um, I, bought, I usually like thick sliced bacon, but for this, the thin sliced bacon works better. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to lay this out. I'm going to take the peppers. I'm going to wrap the bacon really tight. around so you get a nice layer of bacon. These peppers have become a, um, a favorite at work and also a favorite at home. They're easy to make and they're, uh, you can make these up to probably, you know, make them in the morning up to about six hours early. Kate, do you want to hand me the pan? And magically, we have a bunch of these produced.
What I like to do is I like to put a toothpick in about where the bacon stops, and that way when you cook them, the bacon doesn't shrink up and doesn't, um, you'll end up, it'll unravel all the way around. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna put these in the oven at about 350 degrees for about 15 minutes. However, I prefer to put them in the oven for a few minutes, making sure that you put them on a rack so all the oil drains down. If you put them in the oven, our, I prefer on a smoker. So, so if you put them, again, making sure you do not put these directly on the rack so you don't start a fire, put them on a smoker and let them cook for about a half hour in low heat, they're absolutely amazing. You guys can remove all this. Now that we have our, um, just like in a um, cooking show on TV, when you, um, you turn around for a second and you have things come out of the oven done, it's pretty magical. Um, we have these poppers that are, are done. What I like to do is get the bacon crisp so you get that nice texture on there. And then for display, we're just gonna take these, take the toothpick out you can bring that over. These are also incredible as a, um, one of the things I like to do is put them in a hamburger. You can trim off the end right here and you have a, a nice cheeseburger. You have your bacon and your cheese. Uh, also, as we're going to do mac and cheese in a little bit, you can put them in your mac and cheese. So Caitlin's going to decorate these with a little, garnish them with a little cilantro, a little Mexican style sour cream. And then again, they're a very good item to, and, and use your creativity. Use different types of cheeses, you can use prosciutto, and this is a, can be one of your fa uh, family favorite appetizers. Now we're gonna go to pot roast. One of my um, favorite things of working here at WSU is the products that we have. Uh, we have our own cattle ranch, we have our own uh, creamery, organics farm, orchard. We ha today, we're using the WSU uh, Wagyu beef. And if you can, I don't know if you can see the marbling in here, but the, it has incredible um, um, fat, but also incredible structure. When you're braising something like this, you want to have the marbling, but you also want to have uh, what we call connective tissue. So the chuck or a brisket or something like that works extremely well for um, braising. This is the chuck roast here. And it's, um, again, Wagyu beef is uh, a breed that, that's Kobe beef is actually from the Wagyu beef breed. And it's just an incredible opportunity for me to be able to use this beef here. One of the things that I um, believe highly in is you must always season your meat before cooking it. We're gonna add a little oil to our pan here. Uh, very important, this is something Julia Childs taught me in one of her books, is making sure you dry off your meat before you add your oil to it. I add a little oil, a little seasoning to it. If you have moisture on your meat, when you put it in the pan, you're gonna create steam and it's not gonna brown. So it's very important to get that moisture off there. And as a chef likes to, um, you like to hear that sizzle, right? I don't know if you can hear that right now on the live stream, but you can hear that kind of sizzle. That's a, that's a good sound showing that I have proper heat. This is the salt and pepper mixture that I'm putting on here. And you don't want to put, um, we want to put just enough oil in the pan so you can get a good sear on it. We do not want to put too much in there. Uh, oil is good, however, we don't want to um, have so much in there, kind of, we don't want to add that fat to the sauce. One of the things in our cookbook, we talk about cutting the meat into six equal size pieces. You're gonna end up with little trim pieces and things and, and definitely use that still. You're making a pot roast. Uh, one of the things that make our pot, separate my pot roast recipe from most pot roast recipes is that we cut our beef into smaller pieces. That way you get a sear all the way around instead of having that big pot roast and only getting the sear on part of it. 
This way you get to sear all the way around and the pieces are, um, when they're done, they're portion size. So they don't dry out. You don't have to slice it and they don't dry out, so. So we're gonna get a nice sear on the beef. While that's cooking, what we're gonna do is we're gonna add in, I have a lot of secrets to my pot roast. So another secret that I like to do is our vegetables are cut really small. I have my carrots, celery, and onions. What I do here is I love the, the flavor of vegetables when they cook down and they kind of disintegrate. However, I still like the flavor of uh, the texture of vegetables when you get a nice um, crunchy uh, vegetable. So when you see the end result of this pot roast, you're going to see that we kind of go for the best of both worlds. Um, we're going to go for um, these vegetables. I cut them small so they'll break down into the sauce. And you can see the nice sear on the beef. That's the caramelization of the proteins and the sugars in the proteins. That's, in, that's essential to have great flavor in, in your pot roast on and on any beef dish. You gotta get me out there first. So as these are searing, um, we have our vegetables cooking over here. Normally, I'm doing this in a couple different pots for time's sake. When you're making a pot roast or a stew, it's one pot cookery. You want to develop all those flavors. So what we would normally do is brown our meat in here. Remove it, set it aside. Then we'd add our vegetables right to here, which is what I'm going to do now. I'm just, I did this just because for time's sake to kind of get them going and show you kind of the sweating out process. So we're going to add them right to this pot. You can leave that there. Maybe just wipe that out and put that back on. What we want here is we want the developing of flavors. When you, you have your vegetables cooking in here, you start with your... Um, your beef in here, you, you develop the flavors in the pot. You caramelize your vegetables, you develop more flavors. You want all those flavors to develop right in this one pot. Um, I'm also a huge fan of the um, of uh, crock pots. I think that you know you, you need to do. You can do the same process. You still need to brown everything before you put it in there, but do the same process. Put everything in, go to work, and you have this incredible meal. So we just brown these vegetables just a little bit here. A little bit of garlic. Then we have our red wine. One of the things with, um, when, you're, when you're cooking with wine, it's very important to cook with a wine that you would also drink. Uh, I'm not saying that everybody should be drinking wine right now, <laughs> but it's, it's important to, if, if it's not good enough to drink, it's not good enough to make a sauce with. If you reduce something that's bad, it's gonna get worse. If you reduce something that's great, it's gonna get better. So we have our wine. The other thing I always recommend is never pouring directly out of the bottle, because if you pour directly out of the bottle and you have open flames, that uh, those flames can come into the bottle and you can have, uh, you can have a problem. So what we're gonna do is we have our, we put our garlic in here. I've seen a lot of times when I'm teaching my students, one of the things that people will do is they'll put the garlic in the pan too soon. If you do that, what happens is the garlic burns. The garlic has a lot of sugar and when the garlic burns, you get that bitterness and we do not, that bitterness is, it, it really can ruin a great sauce. So it's very important to, to add that garlic in. And the garlic should only be in there for about a minute or two depending on the heat of the pan just to release the oils and the garlic and then after you've released those oils we're going to add our red wine now we're going to reduce this down when you add the red wine into your pot there's a lot of the um, 
the, the the kind of the bits and pieces that come off the beef and the vegetables and stuff, that red wine also is going to help pull those things off the bottom of that pan. So it's good to kind of move the ingredients around and lift those things up. That's the real key. Those those components are the real key to a great sauce. Why this is reducing. We have a pot roast here that we made earlier. Same principles here. If you can see, we have um, some oils on the top of here. I don't know if you can see that. We have some oil on the top of here, and that's because there is some fat in, in the beef, and we want to remove that oil um, before we make our sauce. Can you get me another big plate? So we need to remove the beef that's in here. This is the magic of um, doing a, any kind of cooking show or anything is that you have it already done, right? So we're removing the beef and the beef is fork tender, which basically means that you can stick a fork into the meat without, with very little resistance. Um, pot roast, you can definitely not check the temperature on the pot roast or any kind, any kind of braised item. You're looking more for tenderness. You're breaking down that connective tissue in the meat. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a ladle and we're going to remove, just skim over the very top of it and remove some of that fat. And why I'm doing this, I have my vegetables here that I've cut up. And I have my pearl onions here, my carrots. I'm going to show you how to prepare these here in a minute, and my celery. I'm going to brown this a little bit. And if you overload your pan, you will not get any color on your vegetables. So we're going to brown this a little bit. And then we're going to add this to our, our sauce here in a minute. The key to my famous sauce here, this here. So if you can see the, the red wine reduction here, it's getting really close. We want to reduce that down to basically almost to a glaze. So in this pot right here, we have Basically, in this pot right here, we have the, the sauce that the pot roast has been cooking in. So now what we're going to do is we're going to blend this up. What I like to do is all those carrots and the, all this product that's in here is going to be the thickening agent for my sauce and going to build a lot of flavor because you have that cooked vegetables and everything in there. So I always like to tilt this, make sure that if you're using a handheld mixer like this, that it's totally submerged. And I'm going to blend this up. And the nice thing is you're not using a roux, which is the flour and oil mixture. You're not using any kind of slurry. You're actually naturally thickening this sauce. And you're doing it, doing it with flavor, which is the carrot, celery, and onions. If you do not have something like this, you can actually just use a blender um, at home, which, which would work just, just as well as this. So now, we have this incredibly thick sauce. I don't, that we're going to finish cooking the rest of our product in. So at this point, we're going to cook these vegetables a little bit more. We're going to get some nice color on here. And while those are cooking, I'm going to show you a couple tricks of the trade here. One of the things I always like to teach my students about um, cutting an onion is that there's one way never to cry when you cut an onion, and this is the best secret that you're going to hear here tonight. 
What is it? <laughs> it's become an executive chef and have somebody else do it for you. So we're going to take the onion. And basically, uh, this is for this stage right here. We're going to cut it in half. And I kind of cut towards the, the base of the onion, keeping this one part right here that kind of holds the whole onion together. Learning how to dice an onion is a trick that will definitely pay off. We're going to then cut it, going towards that base again, kind of holding everything together. So we slid it, sliced it like this way, and then sliced it here, and then we end up with this nice cut. Makes a very easy way to, makes it very easy to cut an onion. For pearl onions, I did an event in um, California this last week, and one of the guests said they love pearl onions, but they hate to, to prepare them. So one of the secrets to preparing a pearl onion, if you try to peel these little onions, it's going to drive you nuts, right? It's not going to be very much fun. So what we do is we boiling water for about 13 seconds and then into ice water, and you just barely trim the top of your onion. So you trim off this piece so that you, you want to leave most of it connected so it doesn't fall apart when you're cooking it. Then you're able just to squeeze. You just put pressure right at the base of it, and the onion pops out and it's peeled. So pearl onions become a very, very simple. Can you give me another bowl for? For our carrots and um, celery. I like to do a cut, called a paysan cut, which is basically I just take it and I'm just turning it, turning my knife, and it gives you a very kind of unique cut. And all I'm doing is angling the cut, and you kind of come up with that kind of fun. I like that rustic look cut for stews and pot roast. Carrot, same idea. You're just turning it. And again, you end up with that, I like that for, you can see the, the rustic cut to it just kind of gives it a fun, unique shape. Okay, now that our um, red wine is reduced, I'm going to add my stock. To it. Now using stock, very important when you're making a braised dish or any dish. The sodium level in the stock, we make all of our own stocks here, so there is zero salt in this right now. If you buy a stock at, for, at the grocery store, which I do sometimes too, I don't have time at home to make a stock every, t every time I make dinner, make sure, I would make sure to buy a low sodium stock, uh, one of the pre-made ones, uh, the, the base, is not the base, I, I don't like the bouillon and stuff, I, it has a lot of salt in it, but there are some really good um, products out there that are, are stocks uh, in the, by the soup department. However, remember that it is salted. I never season any kind of braised dish or any kind of sauce to the very end. If you're using a salted stock, pre-salted stock, your dish can become very, very salty, so be very careful. Again, this has, this has no salt in it. So I'm going to bring this now that I have all my ingredients in here. I have my, um, uh, my stock, my beef stock I just put in here. I have my rosemary and thyme that's chopped right here. Put this in here. And I'm going to bring this to a simmer. Uh, very important when you're making anything braised. There's a lot of connective tissue in this meat. You never want to um, uh, boil it. If you boil it, it's just going to get tough. So simmering is very important. Simmering, the big difference between simmer and a boil, is simmer is tiny bubbles, a boil is rapid bu bu uh, bubbles. So you want to make sure that you can just see little tiny bubbles um, popping on the top of the surface. If not, you're going to end up with a very tough dish. You're going to go through all this work and, and the dish is going to be very, very tough. So now that it's, it's coming to a simmer, I'm going to add in my vegetables.
some of my potatoes. Then I'm going to add back in my meat. I'm going to bring this to a simmer, put a lid on it, and put it in the oven for probably about um, 25, 30 minutes until the carrots and, and everything are tender. But the beauty here is I end up with that great flavor of the cooked vegetables. Also, I get that fresh vegetables at the end, and, it's, um, and it becomes a lot of that fat from the chuck. Of, it's still, the flavor's still there, but I've pulled a lot of that off in the skimming process, so you end up with a... Um, uh, a very flavorful product um, that is that has a lot of texture and you want to give me the other and and again I didn't have to use any kind of thickening agent in here um, if you could smell this right now this has absolutely great aroma and it's a it's a great dish again I'm a chef but I love the crock pot I love putting this in in the um, crock pot before I come to work and then you get home and you have this wonderful dinner waiting for you so now as the magic always happens on TV, we have a finished product here. So we have a bowl here. Very important thing too, I really believe in hot food should be served hot. So if you're using a bowl, make sure that you're using a hot bowl. Uh, if you put, cold, if you put a, your hot dish into a cold bowl, it's going to cool down right away. And you, again, the flavor profile will not be the same. You don't have me a fork. So now we have this. So here we have the, the braised beef, all the vegetables. Um, the vegetables are nice and tender, but they're not falling apart because you're able to put those in at the very end. Your meat is nice and fork tender. Fork tender means that you can go through with very little resistant, resistance. You also want to make sure that it still holds its integrity when it's done so that it's not falling apart. Um, but this is, this is perfectly cooked. And um, again, this is one of those things that, are, that a lot of times it's better that next day. So um, definitely when we make a pot roast at home, we'll make you know, a double batch of it and then have enough for, for leftovers on, the, on that Thursday night leftover night. So now probably to the dish that everybody's okay, waiting. Okay, I'm sorry. Hate to interrupt you, <laughs> Chef. We've got a ton of questions coming in on the okay. pot roast, so we wanted to take five and ask you quite a few questions, if you're okay with that, on the pot roast in sure. particular. So, Cassie? Yeah, the first question we have is, what temperature do you use to reduce the sauce? Well, I, I like to use a pretty, um, not a high temperature, kind of a medium high. You don't want it so high that it's going to burn the edges. So that's a great question. So you want to, you want to, on a pretty good temperature so you do get a reduction. But again, not so much. Sometimes you get it too hot and it burns the edges. And that'll give you a bitter flavor. Um, another question we have, do you let the meat cool to make it tender? Or how else would you make it tender? The meat tenderizes from cooking slowly in that broth. So um, it's, just, it's just heat and time is what it really tenderizes that meat. So by the searing it, it's just adding flavor. Yeah, one of the things that they used to say is with all beef products that you sear it and you lock in flavor, well, that's wrong. You actually searing adds the flavor to it. And that slow cooking in that liquid, it's called milk moist heat cooking, just adds that flavor and also tenderizes it. And if you wanted to make the sauce thicker, would you use arrowroot or how else would you make it? Uh, arrow, you can use arrowroot. Arrowroot is very expensive. Um, you can use a cornstarch slurry, which is uh, arrowroot's same thing, where you use a little bit, little bit of water, cold water, in with the cornstarch and add that to the liquid. You have to be very careful that you pull all your, your vegetables and your, um, you do that before you add your meat and everything back into it at the very end because you, don't, you need to bring that to the boiling point and that'll make your meat tough. 
and you need to whisk that in um, slowly, steering at the boiling point. And if you do that when the meat's in there, it's going to tear it apart and also um, make it tough. And the last question for now, how could someone get the WSU wine off-site? I didn't really talk much about the, um, the wine. The wine that we produced, um, uh, we produced that with uh, Mary Sellers, a local winery here, and it was a student project. So we actually, it is not for sale. It's just for um, internal, uh, for events when we have guests coming to campus and, and, and things. But it's, a, it, it's just an incredible opportunity that we, we live in this. Again, we have our local products here on campus, but the local companies and stuff and the, and the products that are around the Palouse are amazing. Thank you, we'll get back to the cooking now. All right. Okay, so what we're gonna start with today is we're gonna start with, um, of course, <laughs> let me back up a little bit. We're gonna start with a, a couple of our products here. Again, back to the Cougar Gold Cheese uh, product. Most of you who, uh, that are connected with Dev Issue know this is our creamery here. Um, the Cougar Gold Cheese is more like a sharp cheddar, a white sharp cheddar. The crimson and a lot of the other cheeses are more like a jack cheese. Um, today we're going to use a combination of the jack cheese and the cheddar cheese. When we're um, choosing a pasta for mac and cheese, uh, I kind of like just to have, the cookbook is supposed to be insp inspirations. Everything that I teach, that I'm teaching today should be an inspiration. It should not be the way that you have to do it exactly. When you're choosing your pasta, I like to choose, this is a, um, a really large macaroni um, noodle. I like to choose kind of things that are kind of creative and fun. Um, when I first came to town uh, to WSU, I went over, we got invited over to some people's house for the first time. Um, I asked them how many kids they had coming over. So I'm the new chef in town. I show up with mac and cheese. Um, and I thought, why is this guy showing up with mac and cheese? I made two huge pans of it. Um, the kids, of course, loved it. The adults waited for the kids to go through, and then they finished it off. And then for the next few years, every single time I got invited anywhere, even though I was you know, this chef that could do these creative, fun things, this is what I got asked to bring, was this mac and cheese. So uh, mac and cheese, starting with, again, great products and applying simple techniques. Um, it's, a, it's a fun dish. Um, and one of the things I talk about, to, we, you know, we talk about healthy cooking. We make this mac and cheese at home maybe four, six times a year. It's a special occasion, right? We got all this cheese, we got all this cream. Um, it's, it's a great product for, for those, the, a great dish for those special holidays and those special um, events. Um, we still get asked to bring the mac and cheese. But I believe you put Cougar Gold cheese and, and our bacon in anything, it, it's actually pretty good. So, so we're going to start off with uh, kind of a basic cooking technique, a thickening agent, which is roux. Roux is by weight equal parts fat and flour. Um, the flour that we use here actually is um, WSU wheat research flour, so we're able to um, do a lot of different research with our flour, uh, which is, uh, again, we call this the chef's playground here, all these wonderful products. So we're putting our oil in here. We're going to add our flour. We're going to cook this. You can kind of see it simmering up. We're going to cook this for about five minutes. We want to... Um, Remove some of the um, kind of that flour, that kind of real strong flour flavor. The key here, though, is on low heat. You do not want to cook this too high of heat because if you do, it's going to it's going to get brown. It's going to give you kind of a nutty background flavor, and we do, we don't want that for this sauce here. So while that's cooking. What I've done here is I've heated my um, milk and my um, heavy cream. And it just kind of allows, it, it doesn't say that in the cookbook, but it definitely allows you to um, cook your sauce a lot quicker. The other thing I've done here is I have my boiling water. A couple of secrets to, if you can see me through the steam, to cooking pasta is at least one gallon of water, one tablespoon of salt, to one pound of pasta at a rapid boil. And my mom, my grandma, my aunts, everybody used to put tons of oil in there to keep it from sticking together. Oil does nothing to the pasta, but it creates this really expensive water. Uh, because the oil floats to the top. The pasta is cooking down in the water. So when you add that oil in there, all you're doing is creating expensive water. So there's no reason to add oil in there at the beginning cooking process. So we're going to add our pasta, rapidly boiling water. Very important stage. 
is to stir that pasta right away. If you don't, what's going to happen? You're going to um, you're stir that. You're going to uh, all your pasta is going to stick to the bottom, and then you're not going to be able to get that off. The, it's just going to stay there, and it can burn, but also it just won't come off. The starch because of the starch in the pasta, it'll stick to the bottom, and you won't be able to get it off. So um, I have the opportunity to take students to um, to Italy every year, and one of the the things in terms of um, choosing your pasta that we've learned is. In most restaurants in Italy, they're using a lot of dried pasta. Dried pasta you can cook nice and al dente. Making sure, choosing, an, you can buy a very inexpensive pasta. I know a lot of you are students out there. Um, but looking at the pasta, making sure it's a high durum, uh, or durum product, should have a little yellow color to it, a little texture. Um, buying a really cheap pasta, the problem with that is the sauce doesn't stick to it. It just kind of runs off. If you ever made that big spaghetti plate and you put the sauce with it and all the sauce goes to the bottom, it's because that pasta has no texture. So kind of understanding what your pasta is. So um, one of the things I always look for is that it, it contains durum flour and that it has a yellowish color. And, um, and some of them even talk about the drying of the pasta. Kind of a slow drying is a better pasta too for holding the sauce. So while this is cooking, so this has been cooking for about five minutes. You want to give me a smaller, they're right there. So important stage here, if you can see, we're going to add a little bit of cream at a time. And we're doing that so we can work out the lumps. If you added all the cream in there at one time, you may get lumps in the bottom, and then you get those big chunks of flour, which um, I know we're making a cheese sauce, but you're not going to hide that flavor of the, of the flour if you get a big chunk of flour in there. So we want to make sure we mix that up really well and really work out those, that flour. So basically, what we're doing here is by using milk, it's a classic sauce, which is called a bechamel. We're really making a classic bechamel sauce that we're going to turn into a cheese sauce. So now that it's, it's yeah. Now that we have a smooth consistency, we're going to add the rest of our milk product. This is a, a very important stage of your sauce. You want to bring it to the boiling point, and you have to really stay on top of it because there's a lot of starch in here. You have the flour and everything in there. If you walk away from the sauce right now, you can end up with uh, uh, getting burnt on the bottom, and again, you're going to end up with that really bitter flavor. And once it gets burnt, you basically have to start all over again. This basic sauce can be used for uh, multiple other things. This could be a, a used for a base in a soup in a cream of broccoli soup or something. The, the bechamel is a base for a lot of different, um, the different products. So we have to bring this to the boiling point. You have your flour in there. What's really important to, to understand about what we're doing here, if you don't bring it to the boiling point, you're, gonna, you're not going to cook out that flour flavor. Flour has a distinctive flavor, and those starches need to expand. And when they expand, that flavor kind of goes through, and the milk incorporates with them, and you don't have that strong, um, that strong flour aftertaste. So we're going to bring to the, the boiling point here. And we're going to turn it down to simmer. And then usually I would let this cook for about 15 minutes on very, very, very low heat. 
when I say if your electric stove, it should be on the lowest heat. If that's even still too high, pull, pull it off to the side a little bit. Um, but very low heat. We do not want this to burn. We're just trying to cook the, um, again, starting to let those, um, all those starches expand enough and, and get cooked into the milk product. So, but right now, today, just for this being live, I don't think you want to watch me stir milk for 15 minutes. So what we're going to do is we're going to pull this over. I keep on saying this is the most important part, but this is the most important part. If you've ever made a cheese sauce before, you've had it break on you before. I'm sure I have. I've made a lot of mistakes in the kitchen. And it's one of the things I write in my book is cook without fear, right? You have to be willing to make mistakes, but kind of learn from those mistakes. When you're adding cheese to a sauce, you must pull it totally off the heat. If it gets too hot, that cheese is gonna, the fats are gonna separate from that cheese and you're gonna have a broken sauce and you're gonna get that chalky kind of um, flavor and, and we don't want that. So we're gonna add, again, it's pulled off, totally off the heat, this burner's not on. And we're gonna slowly add our cheese to this. Stirring constantly. Kate, how's our pasta doing? One of the benefits I have here too is uh, working with lots of students and um, uh, being a culinary educator and, and an executive chef for WSU is an incredible opportunity. Uh, they, they definitely keep me in line here. So you want to just mix this till it's totally incorporated. Now I have the Crimson Fire. This is what makes this macaroni and cheese very, very, the, the cougar gold cheese is great, but that little bit of spice is incredible. Again, if you want to add more crimson fire and less of the cougar gold cheese, or if you just want to add more cheese, that's okay too. So we're gonna add the rest of that cheese to it, and then we're just gonna mix this until it's totally incorporated. For checking your pasta doneness, um, my, you know, you hear all kinds of people saying throw it against the wall. Throw it against the wall or, but that doesn't work out very well for your house, right? It kind of stains the, the only way to really tell that it's done is by either cutting into it, and I'm not going to bite into it right now, or biting into it. So you want to make sure that it's al dente, which means it has no crunch left in it. When you're making mac and cheese, if this is, if this is, if it's overcooked, it's just going to be mush. You have to make sure that your pasta is not overcooked. Again, it should not have a crunch to it, but it should have al dente, which means firm to the tooth, so that it has some texture, especially with a mac and cheese when you're going to cook it further. And that big pot right there. Okay. When the pasta's done, Normally, of course, I would not be doing this in a pan. You would do this in a sink. Um, I'm going to do this in this pan just so that you can visually see it. Pasta needs to cook for a little bit longer. What I like to do is I like to put, we have a thing called background flavors. I like a little bit of nutmeg in my mac and cheese. I don't like that, the nutmeg to be, I don't want it to taste like, um, you know, kind of that Christmassy kind of mac and cheese. I want it just that background flavor. Background flavor means that there's a little bit in there and you really can't tell what it is. So we're doing just a little pinch of nutmeg, a little pinch of white pepper. And white pepper and nutmeg can be very, very, very overpowering. You're going to, um, we're going to add a little bit of salt. Okay. Kate, do you want to grab me a couple spoons? One of the things that I always tell everybody too is if you're making a sauce, you go through all that trouble of making an incredible sauce, you go through all that trouble of making your pot roast, and you don't taste it for salt and pepper and, and flavor profiles before you serve it, and then you serve it and it's, it's flat or bland. Um, and that's why I stay so skinny because I have 80 students in here and I have to try all their food. So, uh, so but I always believe you have to taste it, right, to be able to, to tell. And it's almost perfect. Can you give me that bowl right there? Bowl. There you go. So I'm going to add a little bit more salt to it because I have to remember that I'm adding my pasta in there. 
a little bit more nutmeg. And my nutmeg, I like to use whole nutmeg and just use microplane to kind of, um, you can even go right into it. Stir that up. I'm gonna drain my pasta. Again, this would normally be over into a sink. You're gonna bring the other mac and cheese up. Yep. You're gonna take this, let it, I'm not gonna rinse this off at all. I'm going to let it drain a little bit. Make sure you shake it around, let the steam dry it off a little bit. And then for this mac and cheese, for this mac and cheese, we're going to put it right back in the pot that you cooked the pasta in. There's no reason to dirty another pot. We're going to add the sauce into it. And this is going to seem extremely, extremely wet at the very beginning and, and like it's not going to work. And this is one of the things that we put in the book. If you look at how soupy this is, it does not look like this is going to be a great mac and cheese, right? It looks like it's, but what's going to happen is you're going to put this into a casserole dish. And again, you see how soupy it looks? We're going to cover this, bake this, low temperature. You do not want to bake this too high of a temperature. If you bake this too high of a temperature, again, what's going to happen is that cheese is going to um, separate. And if that cheese separates, it's going to get kind of that chalky flavor and it's not going to have that off flavor. So what you end up with, this is hard to imagine looking at these two next to each other, that your mac and cheese is going to end up this consistency. And you get that nice creaminess. A lot of times your mac and cheese, when you make it, you'll think that it's, it's going to be perfect. And by the time you get it cooked, it's like a brick. So it's important to, um, I like a nice creamy mac and cheese. If I'm going to have my bad day and eat really bad mac and, not bad macaroni and cheese, but bad for you mac and cheese, this is not the healthiest dish. I want to enjoy it. I want it to be nice and creamy. Um, so what a better way to enjoy cougar gold cheese um, than with this mac and cheese dish. And again, the thing I like about this is a five-year-old will like it, an 80-year-old, 90-year-old will like it, all ages love it. And so it's a great dish to serve for friends and family and to showcase Cougar Gold Cheese. Well, now that we're all starving, we're going to take some more generalized questions and we have a few that are specifically to the mac and cheese. First question is, is the cougar gold an oily cheese to work with? It is not, actually. It's, um, it's a little bit on the drier side. So it's, it definitely, um, and, and again, because I, I use just um, cougar gold cheese in here, you can see this is definitely, I mean, it's, um, it do, does not have that oily texture to it. Sometimes for, um, you know, if I'm making this dish for a lot of little kids, I will put a little bit of regular cheddar or something in there to cream it up just a little bit. Um, how would you make the sauce thicker for those that like it a little bit? Well, you know, I, even though if you look at this, this is really thin, but you look at the end result here, I'd be very careful because the, the pasta has starch in it. We talked about starches thickening the sauce. So when you bake this, the starches from the pasta are going to thicken the sauce. So, and that's why I definitely made sure, that, and I like to explain this, it looks like it's not going to work. But those starches off that pasta definitely um, help thicken that sauce. And does heating the cream help it from not clumping in the roux? What heating the cream does, especially when you're making this big of a batch, it helps get you to the um, thickening stage quicker. If you put cold cream in there, and you can, you can definitely start with um, making your roux, taking half and half or milk right out of the refrigerator and pouring in there. The problem with that, though, is it takes a long time to get it up to temperature. And during that time, if you're not really careful, the starches on the bottom of the pan can um, burn. And so you have to stay right on. It's going to take you probably another eight minutes to get to that stage. Um, you just have to worry about the protein counts. You can use whole wheat flour. Um, and there's also whole wheat um, pasta available. And one of the things that for mac and cheese that, um, and, I, and I love my wife, and I thought she was crazy when she first did this. But another thing you can do actually is take just, if you want to make this a lot lighter, 
just take pasta, cook it off, some diced tomatoes, even canned diced tomatoes, the Kugel cheese, and not the cream. And you have this incredible lighter version of the mac and cheese. And, and it's become one of my, <laughs> uh, I'll admit it now, one of my favorite things to, to kind of have for dinner. I don't know lighter. about that. If I'm doing <laughs> mac and cheese, I'm going yeah. all out. <laughs> but there are ways to kind of to lighten that up too. And you, you can use whole wheat pasta. You can also, um, there's other starches you can use and you can use, it's really hard to find the right ones, but you can also do it gluten-free. Um, the temperature is very important. It depends on the oven. Our ovens here are, um, every oven is different. Your home oven, your commercial oven, and every brand of home oven is different, whether it's convection or not. I always like to say about 225 degrees for about, um, about 10 minutes. Now, 225 degrees in some home ovens, it would take four days, right? I mean, there's some, some ovens that just don't work very well. So in the, you just have to learn your um, oven. What you don't want is you don't want it to be um, basically almost like bubbling in the pan and boiling. You want it to cook really slow. The other thing that's with the mac and cheese that makes it really good is if you heat your pan, you're starting with hot pasta. So your pasta's hot, your sauce is hot, your pan's hot. So you really don't have that far to take it, right? You have everything's to a good temperature. So when you put it, when you're getting ready to put this in the oven, everything's hot. See how this is already starting to set up in the middle? Mm -hmm. Everything was hot, including the pasta and everything. So you don't have to get it. You're basically just cooking it just to kind of make everything kind of hold together. Mm -hmm. um, it does not take that long. If you, if you take cold pasta, a cold pan, and, and you go that route and you cool down your pasta, it's gonna, you're gonna, it's more likely to break your sauce too. Mm -hmm. So I have a couple of questions. You talked about how oil, adding oil to the pasta would do nothing for it. What do you recommend for not keeping the noodles from, or the pasta from sticking together? Um, using The way that you're gonna get your pasta from not sticking together is using the proper amount of water, for one, and also um, the high temperature. It has to be rapid boiling, unless, of course, you're making a ravioli. Ravioli, you need to have a simmer, it's gonna tear apart the ravioli. Mm -hmm. But the reason your pasta, and then stirring it right away when you get that pasta in there. A lot of times you see people drop the pasta in there and they kind of walk away, and then that pasta all sticks together. So mm -hmm. you have to stay right with it and continue to mix it. It's very important. Okay, and just because we did movie magic here, it looks like, do you add cheese on the top after we it did comes out? Yeah, we did add a little okay. bit of cheese to it. You can do cougar gold cheese or cheddar, and then we did put it in the salamander, to, or salamander, sorry. You guys don't have a salamander at all. <laughs> uh, salamanders are a broiler, so definitely broil the cheese on top a little bit. And you can add breadcrumbs to your cheese and all different types of things. Mm -hmm. Again, all these recipes are just supposed to be an inspiration for you to create your own masterpiece. Okay, and then a couple of questions that we've had while we were planning this event that I think has gone beautifully were um, on the cookbook, if you have plans for another cookbook. Well, um, I, I, kind of, I would like, I enjoyed the process. It was a hard, it was hard work. I, I definitely, in my future, I would love to write another cookbook. Mm -hmm. I, and, and this cookbook is, um, it's just a great way to showcase the best of WSU, our students, which I think is the best of WSU, but our programs too, organics, farmer, orchard, viticulture, wine business management, um, all, you know, just our, all of our farms and our cattle ranch. There's so many good things here on campus that, again, we call this is just playground. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah, perfect. And I'd also like to take a minute to bring back our two assistants. I'm really glad that Caitlin doesn't go by Kate because it would have been terrible having to say Kate and Kate. Um, but Caitlin and Kate, can you just give us both of your, um, just a little bit of the experience that you've had, maybe what your favorite thing has been? Um, it has been such a great experience working here. I've learned so much. I actually got to be a part of uh, creating the cookbook. So that was an awesome experience. Um, like I said, it's kind of a student-led kitchen. We do have chef, but it's very hands-on, so you really get some good industry experience. Well, that's tough to beat. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm gonna go again with the experience. Um, I've been working with chef for almost two years. We give each other a lot of lip, but <laughs> we get along really well, and I've learned so much in this kitchen, not only as a chef, but also as a manager. Um, we're in a hospitality business management program, and so that's definitely a goal that our program has, and they do a very good job with it. So that's something that I appreciate. Now, just, a I think we have a few minutes left here. Um, a couple of things for our students out there. If, 
if in the future there were to be an online program, I mean, the three of you, all three of you, what kind of advice would you give to our students as far as joining that program, perks of being in the program, things that you've learned that they could learn? I know you talked about experience, but maybe, um, you know, other things that could excite them to join that program if it were to come in the future. I would say um, hospitality is one of those things that you're a people person. Um, my selling point for that is for students, um, hospitality applies to a lot of different things. Um, maybe you don't want to be a chef, maybe you don't want to run a hotel, maybe you're going to end up at a golf course, maybe a casino. Um, it's a very versatile degree and so I definitely encourage that. Um, I know I thought I wanted to go into culinary and I figured out what hospitality business was and that that sold me for WSU and so I would just say go for it. If you're a people person, um, you kind of, you have that that bug, I would say, that people person bug, um, roll with it. Take it to hospitality and you will do well, so. And one of my students asked me the other day, what would you do if you could change careers right now and you can go back to school and do anything? I, nobody's asked me that for a long time. And I thought about it and my answer was, I'd go work at some great restaurants, go to culinary school, do a hospitality program and become a chef. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would do. <laughs> I would have to agree with Kate. Um, from the second I got into this program, everyone has been so welcoming, students and faculty, and it's just a great experience. You get so many awesome opportunities that come your way, um, and so I would just say go for it. Perfect. Cassie, do we have any other questions coming in? Are there any last minute questions out there? It all depends on the recipe. I think, that, yeah, coconut oil is starting to be used a lot more. I would say, you know, that's the fun thing about cooking, right? It's experimenting. Don't ever, um, I, I just always think be inspired. If you want to try coconut oil on a certain recipe, definitely try it. I mean, that, that's one of those things. That I, if I could go to everybody's home that's watching this show and you teach me one of your favorite dishes, I would become a better cook. So, again, just experimenting, having fun, being willing to make mistakes, being willing to try those different recipes with those different items, I would say, I would say go for it and see, what it, see how it comes out. And then one last question. Do you guys put on hosted meals at WSU? We do. We, we do some fun events. We actually just got back from Napa. We did a week-long event down there. Um, so we, we travel if the conditions are right, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, we travel. We do a lot of um, events here. We do some um, where people come in and actually help prepare the dinner. Uh, we do a lot of catering events here, and, um, and, and it's great experience for our students. And our students, again, they do the purchasing, receiving, do the profit and loss statements, do the scheduling, help with the menu planning. So they are um, really running this operation. I just show up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I have to ask, just out of curiosity, what's the craziest thing that you've cooked since you've been here prepared? Um, I'm the small animal expert of the kitchen, <laughs> according to Chef. Um, I've done quail, I've done duck, um, rabbit. Those are kind of, I mean, we don't do anything yeah. too crazy. Yeah. We don't try to recreate the wheel, but um, we do interesting things very well here, so. Well, it looks like we are almost out of time, so I just want to say really quickly thank you to all of you that showed up tonight. Hopefully you learned some new tricks. Hopefully you'll go buy The Crimson Spoon. It is a beautiful book, not only from the cooking standpoint, but from the artistic standpoint. My mother has it. She calls me twice a week. Kinsey, this book is so beautiful. So please, I encourage you to do that. And also thank you to the three of you for putting on this wonderful show. Our camera crew can't wait to eat. So <laughs> I have to throw that in there. Um, really quick, Cassie, are there any other further questions? Okay. Well, I thank you so much from Global Campus Connections. And thank you to the three of you and Hospitality Business Management for letting us come in. <laughs>